So we're now about to have our first session where we'll be exploring better stories of responding to gender-based violence in the pan pandemic, feminist solidarity in times of crisis. Before we start this, uh, the, the panel, I'd like you to, we, we've uh, prepared two stories of people that we'd like you to simply listen to, to introduce this session. I am Togolese and I have three children. I left the marital home in April 2021 and ended up in a hospital due to domestic violence against my children and me. It was the cries of my six-month-old daughter that alerted the neighbor who came to check on us. Her father dropped her, and I had been unaware of her injuries until we arrived at the hospital. That's when I decided to call the police and make a complaint against my husband. My other children, who are aged 13 and 10, a boy and a girl, are still with their father. I did not know then that it would be so difficult for me to have them by my side. After the hospital, I was placed in a hotel by an association with wounds all over my face and my little girl in plaster. In May, we were placed in a shelter, but by then my residence permit expired and I lost my right to stay at the shelter. Normally, I would go to the immigration office, but they canceled the appointment without providing a new one. My daughter, who will be 16 months old soon, does not have a residence permit either. It is my residence permit that should resolve the situation. However, the process is going very slow with COVID-19. I also sought psychological follow-up for the children, but unfortunately, no action has been taken so far. I said to myself, no one would believe all the things my children and I have been going through. I wanted to see the end. I believe there will be justice. When I have the residence permit, I want to ask for custody of the children and look for work to put things in place and simply continue my life. I was in a toxic and somewhat violent relationship for a long time before the pandemic started and with the pandemic it worsened. My partner had taken me to another city where I was away from my friends and family. I got in touch with an organization who helped victims of domestic violence around seven to eight months before I escaped, which was in January 2021. I saw a post on their Facebook page about the first signs that a person might be a victim of violence and I recognized myself. I got connected with a mentor and we started writing online. I wanted to leave my partner. I lied to my ex-partner that I have to go to the dentist in the city, so I managed to get there even though it took a long time to persuade him to let me go. Then I returned to my mother's place by taking the train. Even though I was in a huge panic that I might get COVID-19, I said to myself, you're either getting sick now or remain tortured forever. For a long time after I escaped, I was miserable. I worked with a psychologist from an organization who helped me a lot when I was having panic attacks. I was getting there day by day. Never actually called the police or social care because I was afraid that if I called the police, they would laugh at me or that my ex-partner would persuade them that I was crazy and that I was the one torturing him. Never felt I could trust the authorities to help me. Now I'm one of the women survivors and at work of women survivors from toxic relationships. So we share our relationships with other people in order to empower them to make a step into their own lives. Not always easy to, to hear these stories, but we intend on giving a voice to people who are often unheard. And we do hope yeah, to give more, more stories, make more stories heard. So now onto this session called Better Stories of Responding to Gender-Based Violence in the Pandemic, Feminist Solidarity in Times of Crisis. So I'd like to, to introduce you to our moderator, the moderator of this session, Aisha Gül. Aisha Gül Altine is Professor of Anthropology and teaching in the, gen, in the Gender Studies and Cultural Studies Program at Sabanchi University and the Founding Director of SU Gender, Sabanchi University Gender and Women's Studies Center of Excellence. Welcome, Aisha Gül.
Thank you so much, Colette, and thank you all for being here, and thank you, um, everyone listening to us online. Uh, it's really very exciting to be at this moment of harvesting the research that we have done in the past two years, sharing the results with you and reflecting together um, on what can be done better in the future. So as theory researchers, we've listened to many stories like the two you have just heard, and we've learned tremendously from the resilience of the people, different uh, kinds of people across the 30 countries uh, we researched uh, about how to respond to the crisis in the most creative ways. And we've at the same time learned tremendously from feminist and LGBTI organizations who were responding to gender-based violence um, as the ones experienced in the two narratives that we just uh, heard. Um, in uh, Turkey, there's a saying among the feminist and LGBTI plus um, uh, organizations and uh, movements, um, solidarity saves lives. Indeed, this panel is about how solidarity has saved lives, how feminist plus solidarity and queer plus solidarity in the most inclusive way has saved lives during the pandemic and beyond. So what we will be sharing with you today are the results of our research and the pilot actions that came of our, uh, out of our conversations from the open studios uh, into the pilot's um, actions on how to creatively respond to this uh, what is called often the shadow pandemic, uh, gender-based violence, and what we can learn about inclusive crisis response towards the future. Um, so we will start today with Maria Lopez Veloso, who will be, um, yes, so this is actually, a, I just want to say a few words about this. This is a feminist queer illustrator, Asla Alpar, who has been traveling this journey with us. She's not here today, but she is with us in sp spirit. And uh, she has uh, um, very generously let us use her illustrations, including this one that really invites us into uh, feminist plus solidarity. So um, I will be introducing the different panelists. We have an amazing round table today uh, of uh, external participants who will be responding to our findings um, and also to uh, presentations on our pilot actions, uh, but I will be introducing them as they come to the stage. So I'll start with Maria. Maria Lopez Veloso has been an esteemed member of our research team, the Resisteria project, but I got to know her first in the Gearing Roles project, another amazing uh, Horizon 2020 project where Maria uh, had very con creative contributions. And she's the lecturer and researcher at the Social and Human Sciences Faculty at the University of Deusto. She has a degree in law uh, and a main humanitarian action and a PhD in human rights. She's done pioneering work on human rights violations. Uh, especially disappearances in the Western Sahara and beyond. And she always does everything that she looks at. She looks at in the most creative ways, developing creative methodologies from humor to theater to performance uh, to stand up. Um, uh, so today she will not be doing a stand up. <laughs> we have seen her do that very creatively before, but she will be presenting uh, Resistire uh, research with us. So welcome, Maria. Thank you so much, Aisha, for your words. And thank you so much uh, to all the colleagues that have helped us to gather these results here today. Uh, it's very difficult to summarize the findings uh, and the numbers that Sophia has uh, shown before in 10 minutes. So we are going to summarize the main findings and sharing with you the aim of the presentation today. So uh, this is the presentation uh, outline. First of all, we want to um, frame uh, gender-based violence in the context of Resistire and why we thought gender-based violence should be a, a, a domain within our research. 
Then we will uh, summarize some of the policy initiatives that we have uh, ma mapped and some civil society organization initiatives, but also we will look at how the re different recovery plans have included or not gender-based violence in the actions that they have developed. Then we will share with you some of the findings. Um, we have started this panel with uh, two narratives uh, that have given voice to some of the stories that we have heard uh, in these two years. But we will see also some uh, numbers and data coming from the uh, analysis of the races. And then I will uh, focus on the policy recommendations and the uh, research agenda uh, streaming from, from the, uh, the data that we have analyzed. So first of all, uh, why did we decide to focus on gender-based violence? Because when we were situating the problem, uh, we were realizing that uh, many women were locked in, in, in places with perpetrators, uh, with their, their aggressors. So what are the consequences for these victims and how could we tackle and approach this situation of violence? Um, from our research. So uh, we started uh, building uh, from this initial worry of uh, people and especially women being tracked in, in places with their aggressors. But then we were realizing also that this situation was responding to other intersecting inequalities that were also correlating uh, with this situation. So that is why we took a gender plus approach so we took into account that uh, this uh, situation of vulnerability is also linked to race, to ethnicity, to migration, to economic dependence. And we try to connect this initial worry with the uh, domains that were defined in the European, uh, uh, in the European equality agenda. Uh, and the strategy on gender equality, but we added also fundamental rights and environmental justice because we thought that it, it was not possible to tackle this domain and this topic without focusing on uh, fundamental rights and environmental justice. So before starting, I would like to um, give some data, preliminary data, on why gender-based violence is relevant and why we decided to focus on gender-based violence. And these data are coming from the UN analysis. Uh, based on this data, 45% of women have been exposed directly or indirectly to at least some form of violence against women during or after pandemic. Uh, these um, aggressions include verbal abuse or denial of basic resources um, and other um, uh, forms of violence also include the denial of communication and also uh, sexual harassment, physical abuses. So we thought that the numbers uh, spoke by themselves and we, we needed to do something on this. So. As researchers, and uh, Ellen has mentioned before that there was um, a combination of activism and research in, in Resistiré. And it's not only in Resistiré, I think uh, that also one of the findings that is steaming for our results is that um, the research agenda and the research community, but also the CSOs have played uh, a very relevant role in focusing on gender-based violence. And they have been bringing to the fore the data and the reality of these women that were trapped in, in uh, situations of lockdown. So um, what we uh, found is that um, during the first policy responses, the gender-based violence uh, was uh, something that increased, and this was also confirmed by our mapping and our data. Um, uh, Gender-based violence was uh, one of the few domains where gender-sensitive policies were implemented, at least in the countries where these measures were included. And these countries uh, were, for example, Ireland, Germany, the Czech Republic, Italy, Latvia, France, Croatia, or Spain. 
when these measures were included in these policy responses, uh, the measures that were implemented were uh, mainly awareness raising campaigns, creating or strengthening helplines or digital counseling services. But we also noticed the, the absence of policies. Some of our national researchers explicitly underlined the absence of measures uh, in countries such as Finland, Bulgaria, or Lithuania. When we are talking about the national, uh, the sorry, the these policy initiatives and these policy measures that we have mapped, um, on a total of 290 policies that we analyze, only the 16% has been identified as dealing with gender-based violence. And with those uh, measures and policy initiatives that we identified, we noticed a difficulty in reconciling continuity and quality of services in the face of a uh, new health and movement regulation, especially, especially during the first lockdown. We also um, noticed that the increased use of digital services that uh, on the very first moment helped some of the services to answer the victim's um, uh, needs, we, uh, we noticed also that these were creating new inequalities. Um, so I will move quickly uh, through the um, different slides. Also, we mapped some of the societal initiatives and we also found the, the important role that the CSOs played in responding to the, the needs of the victims. Sorry, I just noticed that I only have three minutes left, so <laughs> I'll increase the speed of the speed. Uh, so there were a lot of initiatives implemented by the CSOs, and this uh, increased not only the, the number of initiatives, but also the quality of the initiatives when CSOs were taking part in these initiatives. Uh, regarding the national recovery plans, uh, despite of being uh, widely present in the discourse of the national authorities, we realized that uh, only few of them uh, implemented measures uh, dealing with gender-based uh, violence. The majority of the, of the national recovery plans that we analyzed do not mention gender-based violence. And those uh, who does uh, are making general statements on gender-based violence, but very few of them implement concrete measures uh, tackling gender-based violence. So some of the key messages, uh, and I'm going to move very fast here, uh, also coming from the data, out of the 20, uh, 290 map uh, races, only 30, uh, 43 were addressing gender-based violence, and it was never as a central focus. So uh, this, I think, is very relevant when we are talking about quantitative data and where uh, the, the different institutions put the, 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 um, the focus on. So some of the findings are also confirming that the violence increased during the lockdown, th that there was a lack of reporting to police and, and different security members. More, most of the uh, reporting were asking for psychological support and also the increased violence to the LGBT club plus community. Uh, as uh, Sophia mentioned before, we also did some interviews and, and workshops, and uh, I am not going to stay here or neither because she has also mentioned before, but the main findings, uh, findings were that home was no longer a safe place, that uh, there was also intersecting with uh, gender, some uh, aspect like class and migration status, and also that the societal responses played a, a key role in order to uh, answer the, the needs of the victims. So regarding policy agenda, and this was supposed to be the, the central point of the speech, we produced five uh, fact sheets regarding um, gender-based violence. So the main recommendations, I have extracted the presentation in two uh, main aspects. The first one is regarding gender-based violence and the second one regarding crisis responses. So regarding uh, recommendations on gender-based violence, we focus first at the EU level, then at the national and local level, and then during the crisis, where, what were the answers that were provided? So first, we thought that the EU ratification of the Istanbul Convention was needed, and then it happened. And this is the tweet that the European Commission acknowledged uh, the contribution of resisted it. So uh, we, uh, our recommendations uh, aim to strengthen the EU legal framework to incorporate gender plus and intersectionality into the actions, to collect data, and to foster prevention programs and awareness raising campaigns. 
At the national and local level, we uh, asked them to develop multi-sectoral collaboration and intersectional coalitions to end the, uh, the data gap and to strengthen support services, develop prevention and support mechanisms for digital uh, gender-based violence, and also to uh, break the uh, to end the digital divide to um, make digital technologies safe and accessible for all. And during crisis, uh, we thought that collective data and assess risks uh, for an effective response and prevention of gender-based violence during crisis is needed. That we have to include gender-based violence in all crisis management plans, and that uh, we have to make sure that the that we prevent and protect uh, and prosecute gender-based violence uh, during crisis. Regarding the recommendations on crisis, re uh, crisis responses, I think that we are going to uh, speak uh, a lot about this during the, the round table. So I will leave it here and uh, I will be happy to answer to some of the questions later on in the round table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Of course, we've produced a lot on this issue as well, which you will hopefully read later on uh, in our reports and the uh, fact sheets are back there in um, poster presentation. So now it's with great pleasure that I will uh, invite uh, Zorana Parezanovic, who uh, comes from Belgrade. Zorana is an activist dedicated to the protection of victims of uh, human trafficking and gender-based violence. She's a social worker by profession with extensive experience in social welfare politics. A significant part of her work is de de devoted to the empowerment of young girls and women who survived gender-based violence. And she has been based in the NGO Atina since 2014. And it was Atina that carried out one of the pilot actions addressing gender-based violence through sports. It's with great pleasure that we have Florana with us today. Uh, thanks, everyone. I think, it, first of all, I want to congratulate the Resistire team for an amazing work that has been done in the previous year. And I also uh, want to say that I feel honored to be here today and try to share one of the better stories uh, that we managed to implement in our community and in the country in which we live. Um, as, you, as you heard, I'm representing uh, NGO Athena, organization that is existing for 20 years now and it supports the transition process in Serbia towards the society that fully respects uh, the rights of women and girls in the first place. Through this 20, 12, 20 years, we went through ups and downs and many crises, as you know, especially the ones who are directly engaged in the work with the survivors of different forms of gender-based violence. So along with those women and girls, we managed to establish the long-term programs, which helped them create some better future and better opportunities for themselves. Through our programs, our key goal is to empower and support their inclusion, uh, as well to expand the capacities of all the local communities to identify the problems that they're facing in their communities and help them in creating the actions and the steps to respond properly to them. That also happened during the COVID-19. We are also looking um, uh, forward to help the and build up capacities of relevant institutions and other stakeholders and an organization at the local and the national level. And one beneficial thing for us is learning from other feminist organizations from the region, but also from the world. Uh, one of the most important parts of the program that we are doing uh, is trying to go deep in the field of combating prejudice, marginalization, discrimination that uh, we are having in our society and try to respond to them to non-formal education. And this is one of the things that we did to the project. In those pictures, you can see some of the activities that we are having in Athena on a daily, daily level. What we did with the engaging with gender-based violence uh, through sport project, first of all, we really wanted to raise an awareness and increase prevention among youth coaches, sports managers about the prevalence and the consequences of gender-based violence. Also to mobilize all the relevant actors with the focus on the trainers and sports manager to help them to get to know, know how 
put it in their pockets and implement it on their daily work. We did it to the training program and coaching of coaching sessions, which came after we co-created the training program along with the numerous experts from the field of sport, but also with the expertise in responding directly to gender-based violence. You can see some numbers and the targets, which I'm not going to refer uh, mostly to them, but I'm happy to share some of the lessons learned and insights that we have, because for us, this was also a learning process. Feminist organization starts being included in the sports and trying to use it as a strong method to address gender-based violence and other problems that are uh, that we are facing in our society. So the highlight and the, of the whole project and the action was the inclusive sport event, which opened up the field for everyone to show what we learned. And all the trainers and coaches and managers were able, after the coaching of coaching sessions, they were able to implement this uh, event in which we had like more than uh, 200 uh, children from uh, different nationalities and religious backgrounds, uh, also refugees and migrants coming from Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Afghanistan being part of the local community. We also use this event for a moment to introduce those children to the trainers and possibilities that they have in the local community. Because when we started the event, we realized that not a single child had experience to be a part of any of the clubs. So after the event, we realized that half of them were already applied for uh, being a part of some of the clubs in the local community in which they're actually living. So you can see some of the pictures for trainers and coaching of coaching sessions, as well as to the inclusive sport event. That was the highlight of the project and the uh, activities. So the thing that I really want to focus on and share are the things and the findings, some positive observation and I wouldn't say negative observation, but some challenges and the areas that we think that we should refer in the future. First of all, we confirmed that definitely sport is fostering and self-confidence, discipline, teamwork, and leadership skills, which can be used in addressing and preventing gender-based violence. On the other side, we realized that sports cannot do that uh, on their own. So we map the importance of multicultural, multi-sectorial approach that is involving education, formal education, but also non-formal education and some policy changes. On the other side, we also realize that sports programs can provide a platform to educate about gender-based violence. But on the other side, we met a lot of trainers being frightened because none of them knew what to do if some of the kids come to them and say about the experience of the violence they had. So we mapped that a lot of internal procedures and lessons learned should be given to those clubs and help them be the referral mechanism to responding to the violence in the cases they identify on their own. Um, also, we noticed that some of the sports in the area in which we are living are still reinforcing traditional gender norms and stereotypes potentially contributing to harmful practices uh, and norms and attitudes. Uh, also, one of the things that we confirmed that, that we are really proud of, we realized that really sport can make a really safe space for everyone who is participating in and really be a really pleasant surrounding to open up the dialogue about the problems that society is facing, to talk about tolerance, to talk about discrimination, to talk about inclusion on the other side, and also about the potential partnering that has to happen in order to make all those things sustainable. We realized during our work that none of the clubs which we had uh, in the north of Serbia, in total 10 of them, were aware of the existence of the civil society organization in their hometown. So we managed to bring them uh, during the trainings and also coaching of coaching sessions. So some new stories uh, are preparing because they're working uh, strongly on trying to find out the ideas, how they should get together and start working uh, more about the issue of prevention uh, of uh, gender-based violence. So. Um, 
those are just some of the topics and I'm looking forward also to talk to you during the round table and answer all potential questions. Thanks. Thank you, Zorana and the whole Atina team for this incredibly inspiring better story that you have presented to us in terms of dealing with gender-based violence through sports. So we had under the same call uh, on how to respond to gender-based violence through sports, um, another uh, project taking place in Athens. So we were mixing at Athena and Athens. Athena was not based in Athens and the, uh, Altis Sports Club and Pantene University came together, a beautiful research activism collaboration there, uh, to do a similar project uh, with sports clubs in Greece. And it was, we had the great pleasure as the Sabanja team to monitor this project. And we learned a lot from the inspiring example that they have uh, presented to us. And Panar Insari from our team will be presenting on behalf of them. The main coordinator is not with us today, Rania, because she's training an Olympic athlete uh, who has, by the way, been in, an important spokesperson in this project uh, itself. So very inspiring cases. It's apparently that the Me Too movement took, uh, came out of the sports uh, cases uh, in Greece. And so this project was really important, uh, providing a background to how to address gender-based violence in sports and through sports. So Puner Sari is an esteemed colleague, uh, someone I've uh, learned a lot from through the years. She's worked um, on, uh, she did an MA in cultural studies and she's a PhD candidate now in sociology doing very innovative migration work, uh, focusing on masculinity. And she has been a part of the Sabanja team uh, that has looked into this pilot action. So please Puner. Let me check first if I know. Okay. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. As Aisha Gur said, I will do my best and present the amazing work Altis team and Pantheon University Center for Gender Studies did together. So this was the logo uh, that they um, produced for this project. And ethos is not only a sort of acronym for the project, but also it means it, as a word combines with uh, both human virtues and the Olympic values. That's why we love the name of the project. And on the right side, you also see the logo. I, wanted to, I want to say a few words about the Altis Sports Club. It was founded in 2016 in a suburb of Athens and uh, currently del delivers training sessions in trampoline, artistic gymnastics and gymnastics for all. And its guiding principles are confidence, creativity, teamwork, athletic spirit, and fair play. And uh, one of the most important things, it, the club has adopted safeguarding rules and policies of the Hellenic Gymnastic Federation. So I want to say a few words about the background of the project. The Me Too movement actually inspired this project. Uh, Sofia Bekatoru, which you see in the picture, uh, she disclosed a sexual harassment by a senior member uh, when she was underage. And of course, this stirred a huge media um, scrutiny, but not much has changed after all. Uh, because, you know, even though uh, many cases were brought to the um, court, um, sports organizations have not yet developed activities that challenge this prevailing culture, uh, which is prone to producing gender-based violence. So the Altis team and uh, Pantheon University wanted to fill in this gap with this amazing uh, project. And the idea is to uh, first to organize a series of activities to raise awareness on gender-based violence, and also to collectively reimagine sports in a more gender sensitive way where all gender identities and expressions can coexist together. And the second aim of the project was to um, produce a toolkit which other sports club can use, uh, clubs can use to uh, organize similar activities and uh, to foster the prevention of gender-based violence. So as part of the project, they mapped several uh, sports clubs and they ended up involving five sports clubs and 
faced some resistance of other uh, sports clubs, but in the end, many dozens of, uh, I will give the numbers, athletes uh, participated in the project and not all of them were part of these clubs. Uh, Co-creation of the program was an important activity of the project because through these activities, they not only raised awareness on gender-based violence, but also uh, get the feedback, the observations, experiences of various uh, sports professionals and parents and reflect on gender-based violence together on to co-create the program and also co-create the toolkit. And then uh, they put these wisdom into co-creation workshops and sports camps. These are the numbers of activities um, they organized. Uh, I want to share a few pictures from the workshops. So these workshops, uh, in some children and young athletes participated in them. In some workshops, um, sports professionals like coaches, training team members, sports club managers, and parents uh, participated. So for in the workshop for coaches, training team members, managers, parents, uh, they collectively reflect on what gender-based violence is and how to tackle it and how to deal with the incidents um, uh, of gender-based violence and what is consent. Uh, and of course, there were also workshops for young athletes. And again, they worked on learning consent, respecting our body and the bodies of others and drawing, they drew posters against gender-based violence. You see posters here. And of course, before these workshops and during sports camps, they played games. And in these games, there were mixed teams, there were different rules, there were different balls. So forget about anything you know about sports, all the boring stuff about sports. So uh, I'm gonna talk about an amazing man right now. Uh, I wish he was here ex explaining all this instead of me, Christos Roussos. And he's been organizing this Katatopia festival for 15 years now. And he was bothered by something in sports, like something that took us away from uh, children's games, right? In, the, in our childhood, we were playing games and the games were an excuse to learn about life and experiment and grow together. But although we use the words like game and play in sports, we don't do that anymore. We just, you know, there are these strict structures and rules. And uh, so he was against that. So he created his own balls, which do not evenly bounce every time you do it. And he created different rules so that all children can play together. Young athletes can play together and they can coexist. They can respect each other and have joy instead of this fierce and toxic form of competition. So uh, as part of the project, they also organized the main sporting event. So the first day of the Katatopia festival was this main sporting event. And as I said, they played these games. And here you can see us uh, on our si on-site visit. We participated in the festival. And these are the numbers of young athletes, university students, parents, coaches who participated in the project. Um, during our on-site visit, we had more chance to engage with the uh, project team and we had the chance to talk about the main challenges they had. And it was of course difficult to work with children. Uh, and they kind of expressed the need for more expertise on working with children. And some people were not ready to talk about GBV, but that's okay. And some did participate even more. And the biggest point that still stays with me was all those coaches, parents, managers, they were very angry with what is going on in sports, like unable to protect their kids and don't know what to do. This project um, let them know that they have power and they can do something and then they can be part of the solution. So they acquired new tools to put that into practice. 
And of course, the second thing that I uh, still stays with me was that even if you have the tools, the methods, there is a still a need for bigger safeguarding policies, referral mechanisms. Even if you are a very self-aware coach, there's a limit to what you can do uh, unless there's these policies. So I wanna finish with this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanar. Indeed, very inspiring work. And um, reflecting on what Zorana was saying, a lot of the sports clubs did not have any access to the uh, resources that they could refer to uh, when, for instance, the athletes, the children came with cases of gender-based violence at home. So this project also brings them together with um, people that can really help um, respond to gender-based violence um, outside of, yes, that's what I was looking for. Thank you within and outside of sports. So uh, we're back with us, Laupar's invitation to think about feminist solidarity. And now we're going to have a round table that will do precisely that. We'll be asking, uh, so there are three amazing experts who have joined us today. It is an act of feminist solidarity and they, have all, they all embody feminist solidarity in the work that they do. So I would like to invite our experts and together with the presenters to take a seat at the round table and I will be introducing them as they take their seats. So Aslan Tikin, Aslan is here. Yes, she's in the back. She's coming. I'll start with her. So Aslan is a legal and policy advisor with a background in both law and civil society. She's deeply involved in legal and policy advisory work with a primary focus on the European Union and the United Nations. Since 2006, she has worked hard on human rights, gender equality, women's rights, social policies, and environmental issues. She defines herself as an eco-feminist. She represents um, the Women's Coalition Turkey uh, at the EU and is a European Women's Lobby board member. So Aslan, I've come together, Aslan, in other contexts as well. She, she really does very creative work, embodies the kind of feminist solidarity that we're talking about here and very creative work in terms of how to respond to the different crises that we're living with, in, including uh, those that are based on gender inequality. She also works on cyber violence and gives trainings uh, on the digital divide and the digital gap. And then we have Elena Laporta Hernandez with us. Elena is a lawyer and advisor of a member of European Parliament in the FEM Committee. She has been a lecturer at the Carlos III University in Madrid and a consultant on human rights and gender with work in Egypt, Tunisia, Moldova and Colombia. Um, including the human rights uh, work in the um, Ibero-American states for education, science, and culture. She's done strategic litigation regarding women's human rights and has published uh, quite a bit on um, legal feminist uh, frameworks uh, to address these issues. So we're very honored to also have her join us um, in, in this roundtable. And last but not least, we have Yeliana Brankovic, um, who has done amazing work um, in the last few decades on uh, gender-based violence in different capacities. She's an International Council of Europe consultant, member of Gravio since 2015. Um, she contributed to the development of Council of Europe recommendation on sexism and the general recommendation of Gravio on the digital dimension of violence against women, which we also found out in Resistere is a key component and unfortunately a growing form of violence that needs to be addressed. And it's promising to see that it's finally uh, getting the recognition it needs. And yet we still have a lot of tools to de develop. She teaches at the MA program on gender studies uh, implemented jointly by the University of Bologna and the University of Sarajevo. So she has participated in over 30 international research projects across Europe and Central Asia, mainly focusing on violence against women and has been consulting a lot of international actors and UN agencies. It's really with great pleasure that we have um, this amazing panel. So what we would like to do is to first ask our external participants 
uh, Aslihan, Elena, and Biliana to respond to the risk their findings um, that Maria Lopez um, presented, uh, focusing on the research findings and the pilot actions that you have just heard. Uh, so how does it re resonate with the work that uh, you do? And going against what Madeline yes. was suggesting earlier, we'll have very little time for each of these contributions okay. to keep it dynamic. So we'll have a lot of uh, flow and dynamism. dynamism. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Aisha Gil, and thank you all for, I mean, I congratulate all the partners of the project. It was a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm representing Women's Coalition today here in this uh, meeting, and I was I had the honor to participate to open uh, spaces, um, creative workshops uh, with you as well before. I mean, thank you very much for sharing the findings. It directly reflects our on the ground work as well, our experience on the ground too. As Women's Coalition during the COVID um, crisis period, we have launched a map um, following up the actions, the policies that the local governments, uh, municipalities have been doing and implementing on the ground. So we try to monitor, assess, and get back to them with a feedback on how they actually respond to crisis from a gender and feminist perspective. It was a challenge, of course, we had the first reporting and now we are at the second reporting as well, but Women's Coalition has been in touch with local governments. As you may know, Turkey is um, the state relationships and the anti-democratic environment doesn't give access to civil society or feminist organizations to change the system. So we, like the Istanbul Convention, as you have been referring, has it has been the biggest tool for us to implement and we, Turkey has withdrawn during the COVID time where we wanted to highlight how gender-based violence is you know at the main scope of our work and we wanted to create further awareness and Turkey withdrew uh, due to you know um, the dilemma about family and attacking LGBTI plus community so what we have done we have put Istanbul Convention as the priority for local governments for municipalities that are obliged to implement due to because it, Turkey is still a member of Council of Europe, and we have tried to, you know, create further awareness that municipalities are obliged and bind by the convention. So we continue. We keep saying Istanbul Convention saves lives. Our work continues further on, uh, you know, advocating for the directive, you know, the draft proposal at the EU level, because Turkey is a candidate country, and we will be obliged to be aligned with the, you know, directive. So we further you know, push our limits. So I think I will leave it to here, but I will have further reflections on digitalization and online, you know, um, tackling gender-based violence as well, which is very important to us, but I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. Thank, thank you, Aslahan. Yes, please, Elena. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for the work that you have uh, been doing in, with this amazing project. Um, as was said with the, during the presentation, I was before part of civil society and now I'm working temporarily at the European Parliament. So uh, what I wanted to say very briefly is that from my own experience, um, this project and the recommendations that you made are uh, very much needed both uh, inside and outside the European institutions. Uh, basically because of two uh, reasons. On one side, I think that it allows us uh, to keep proposing ways to move forward regarding gender-based violence and future crises, but also because it allows us to defend our positions, which is not always easy when we are at the European uh, level. So um, to put a, a very concrete example, uh, in the European Parliament, we passed a report on the on this very same topic, on the gender perspective within the COVID-19 crisis and the post-crisis period back at the beginning of 2021, where we refer to uh, some of the issues that you have covered in, in, in your project, right? Uh, those issues are, uh, are are key and are still needed and have not been implemented, right? So uh, this means that we still have to fight in order to have them in place. I'm referring, for example, to data, gender sensitive training, sharing best practices, awareness raising campaigns, the use of new technologies, financial support to civil society organization, the need to follow up previous recommendations. So many of the topics that you have covered were uh, let's say mentioned in this in in the CP report, but they have not yet been implemented. So uh, we need this kind of project to keep pushing for that. 
uh, one concrete example on data. Um, you will know that we have the proposal that was made by the Commission on, on a new directive on violence against women. The good news is that they have uh, introduced quite a strong article on the issue of data collection and research. The bad news is that we do not have a common definition of gender-based violence at the EU level. We do not have an Eurocrime on gender-based violence, which means that it will be extremely difficult to have harmonized data. The work that you are doing helps us to obtain that data while states decide if they're going to be ambitious or not when implementing that article, if the directive is finally uh, passed in the, in the next uh, few months, I hope. Uh, there's also reference to a need to ensure that specialist support services remain fully operational also uh, during crises, of course. This is good, but we need more ambitious ambition. Sorry. So uh, in the EP report, we said that we needed to have a new protocol on violence against women in times of crisis. I think that your proposals, your recommendations can be very helpful to try to achieve something like that or something similar. That was one of the issues that I wanted to cover. The other one, uh, let's say outside the European institutions, although they are also affected by this. I'm extremely concerned uh, regarding the backlash that we are experiencing, I think it was mentioned also in 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 previous in a previous panel regarding women's rights. We have political parties, we have certain groups uh, that are denying, for example, the existence of gender-based violence. We need to react promptly. We, or at least I am, under the impression that the EU will not react <laughs> promptly, and we need, of course, um, civil society, and we need the projects like the ones that you are doing. We need to build narratives against these kind of speeches, and we need to continue working together with researchers and, and together with citizens. We all know what is uh, happening with the Istanbul Convention, although it was finally ratified, also, although only regarding the provisions where the EU has exclusive competences, so we still have a long way to, to see a full implementation in the member states. And the projects, the pilot projects that we were uh, that were mentioned on on women and on gender based violence and sport, I think they are the perfect sample of how to build these narratives. We need to work with civil society in order to try to stop these kind of speeches because I think that is going to be one of the most important things that we will have to tackle in the next you know years. So that would be from from my side uh, the answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you, really so full of insight and so full of the new steps that we need to take all together. So Liliana, please. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And um, I really like um, the recommendations and especially the wonderful positive atmosphere uh, of this event. Um, uh, one sentence, a very simple one. Um, if we want, uh, I would like to concentrate on funding and on transformative funding that you mentioned in your recommendations. That's the key. Because if we want to increase resilience uh, to crisis, I think it's crucial to provide sustainable funding to women's NGOs that provide services to victims. In this respect, Gravio's findings resonate very well with your recommendations. And I must uh, highlight uh, that Gravio um, um, almost completed uh, our baseline evaluation. Um, we published 29 reports uh, so far. So we have a very good overview of the situation in Europe with respect to many issues, but I'm now concentrated on funding only. Unfortunately, I have just uh, two exa positive examples um, of possibly promising practices uh, with respect to funding. Um, one is from Italy, where uh, anti-violence centers and shelters um, are given the property seized from mafia. Uh, I was a rapporteur for Italy, so I saw some of these facilities. As mafia guys are very concerned about security, they are perfect when it comes to security. And secondly, they are very uh, uh, lavish. Um, so it is a great idea to uh, um, provide victims uh, of uh, violence uh, with such uh, premises. That's one example. And another one is from Finland, uh, where the government uh, 
decided to provide funding uh, to change laws with respect to funding so that women's NGOs shelters will not be dependent on municipality funding. That's a, a, a very interesting legal um, example. On the other hand, uh, we notified uh, many problematic practices um, and you will not be happy to hear it uh, when it comes to funding. Um, in Germany, which is the, the wealthiest uh, country uh, in the EU, we noted uh, that uh, uh, women's NGOs are doing a lot of pro bono voluntary work and uh, also that women's, uh, that uh, some uh, victims of um, uh, violence uh, end up in shelters for homeless people. So in relation to Germany, Grevio had to underline that shelters for homeless cannot be uh, uh, considered as a replacement for women's uh, shelters in terms of the Istanbul Convention. There are also other examples um, from Poland, for instance. Um, there, there is something called a, a justice fund or fund for victims of crime. And the problem of women's, NGO, uh, women's NGOs had in relation to this fund was that they were given the answer that because they are uh, working only with victims, uh, with women victims of violence, they are actually discriminating against male victims. This is an outrageous uh, <laughs> argument, um, uh, I would say. Uh, in Malta, we notice, for instance, that women's NGOs have to compete um, in uh, tender procedures, uh, which are designed for different uh, NGOs, including those that are engaged in sports or in culture. So it seems that uh, uh, these uh, uh, type of standard procedure is disregarding the crucial under uh, 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 expertise of women's NGOs, which uh, they provide services in victim centers way, and they have gendered understanding of violence, and they also provide uh, support in confidential manner. So in many of our reports, we repeated the recommendation. Um, which goes uh, like this, just as an example, that it is very important that the authorities provide clear and transparent procedures <coughs> for uh, uh, funding women's NGOs, because in line with the convention, they are obliged to provide funding, not only for state-run services, but also for those programs and services that are provided um, uh, by um, uh, NGOs. And uh, I have to say at the end, and I, sh I should, if you let me uh, talk later a little bit, there is only one recommendation of this pro project with, I mean, the finding of this project with which I simply do not agree, and I will leave it for later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, actually both Elena and Liliana have talked about the recommendations. Maybe Aslan, you can also say a few words about what you would like to add to the discussion on the recommendations, how they resonate with you. And yes. I'd ask Lorana to do the same before we move, we move on to the last question. Thank you very much. I give you the first hint about what we have done during COVID time about the mapping of the municipalities and where we highlighted, it also resembles with all the recommendations, recommendations you have shared. Um, we said, we are not ready for a crisis. So even if it was COVID back, COVID back then, we were saying there will be something else. And Turkey experienced that with the earthquake. Before that, we had the war in the Ukraine. So we were saying we are, our states, our structures are not care proof. We don't have enough you know, structures in place to, to respond. Be it, be it responding only, but also gender sensitive responding. So it was missing. So with, through this mapping, so the, those municipalities we were engaged in 2021, during the 2020 COVID crisis, they replied us back like saying, actually, thanks to your questions, now we were a bit more prepared when the earthquake took place. So we were thinking about what you have asked and we tried to respond accordingly. Of course, our um, both, uh, you know, mappings were, you know, 
uh, giving the profile of you know a certain limited number of municipalities from metropolitan to smaller ones but it, as if is it is shown within your um, recommendations as well it is so much aligned gender based violence if you don't already have structures in place at the local level when there is a crisis they are not ready to respond or be in place immediately those who were already privileged enough to have certain response mechanisms they were there to reply not only during covid period but also during the earthquake you know there is this um how should i say relationship between civil society where civil society is engaged at all levels not for at the bottom but if you listen to the grassroots from the very beginning of the you know from the grassroots at the local level then you see policies and the actions are changing so we see this type of engagement uh, this uh, collective you know existence together with civil society and listening to civil society very important as well um, within your recommendations too so also you mentioned about the you know um, transformational budgeting this aligns with the gender sensitive budgeting we are we keep saying that it's not about really having a project and then adding gender perspective into it but being aware of it from the very beginning so it is about participation at some point how we are engaged with you know uh, female and lgbti plus community disabled women migrant women how are you you know already know their you know issues and how you let them speak about their issues and be the solution bring the you know creative idea to the table so this uh, access is very important that i want to highlight through your recommendations as well we mentioned about the digital you know online violence it is um it's a real fact and it is also tackled through istanbul convention and also through the hopefully with the directive uh, draft version of it i have so many comments on that but i won't <laughs> get into that but i completely agree with your comments so it is very important for us to have this minimum in a way the legal framework but who are those on the ground to implement and who are going to be responding, you know, to the needs that I call it on life, you know, on life advocacy, online and offline are together right now. So we cannot underestimate the power of, you know, digital violence, the gender-based violence, but also we need to speak about, I think this could be an added value to the recommendations as well, digital advocacy how we bring our, you know, positive impact through, I mean, making a tool for civil society organizations. This year at the UN, CSW, it was digitalization at the forefront. But please, when we are talking about digitalization, please don't forget about the most marginalized who do not have access to digital means. Right. Who, I mean, you know, yeah. there are so many opposites that we have to, you know, talk about, but I will leave it to Thank last you, part, further yeah. comments. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Aslan. And indeed, tomorrow we'll have a whole panel looking at that yeah. at digitalization from different uh, perspectives. Can we pass it on to Zorana? Yeah. Joanna, would you like to add anything to yeah, the recommendations? Uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't call them just the recommendations, but the urgent needs yeah. that should be referred and sent to anybody working of all the levels all around on the national, international, and the others. Um, I want to thank Biljana because she 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 mentioned a really important thing, which was uh, 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 transformative funding. In the case of the organization which was providing the direct assistance to the victims of human trafficking during the COVID pandemic, if we didn't have the access to the flexible grants and core support funds, we wouldn't survive it. Um, also, in the moment when the government reported that they could only cover 30% of the needs of the victims of human trafficking in Serbia, so it means the 70% was covered by the civil society organization, which were not help infrastructurally on material level funding or anything by the government in that time. The worst scenario happened that we <laughs> that we didn't want it to, to happen in that time. They decided also to lock down the national shelter for the victims of human trafficking in that time. So basically our mobile team was called in a day and asked to transfer all the all the women and the girls to the shelter and provide them with the long-term support in that sense. So I want to point out if we didn't have, luckily we had it uh, back in time, we couldn't access those women and girls will, will be left behind. So another thing, which is I think that funding needs to be closer to the person with, with the lived experience and also to intentionally give the priority to the organization who are working directly 
with the women and the girls with experience of violence, exploitation, and other forms of human trafficking. Thank you so much, um, Zorana, for those reflections and to all of you, really. It's fantastic to see that our recommendations resonate with your experience at so many different levels, from the grassroots to the public authorities, to the UN and the EU level. And um, Miliana gave a not so good, not so better story from Poland, but our be better story highlighted in the transformed funding fact sheet is also a story from Poland, the amazing fan fund that participates in participatory grant making. And we're very much hoping that these examples will multiply both at, in, at the level of philanthropists, um, funding organizations, and certainly at the level of the EU. And what Aslam presented, the Women's Coalition Turkey is a great story of how to approach crisis as a continuum and how gender plus monitoring can be a model, can be a strategy, a methodology to um, wake up others that crisis is a continuum. Um, so thank you for that. So we'll move on. We're running out of time, uh, but I would love to hear your reflections on the last question that we have, which is how do we go forward? What have we learned from the pandemic and feminist research on the pa pandemic, including in Resistire, um, to move forward, to better prepare ourselves for future uh, crisis response and management? So, Elena, please. No. So, um, first of all, I think that reading your papers, um, I'm under the impression that the diagnosis is clear. Uh, in my other life, before working at the EPA, I also researched a lot on transitional justice. So I read a lot about the impact, the gender impact on, you know, let's call them humanitarian crisis. Uh, and many of the elements that you raised uh, when you were gathering the data are, are similar. Um, of course, this uh, crisis was um, uh, different in some ways. There are some elements that, of course, made this uh, the, the, the nature of this crisis made it different. And one, I think, one of the added values of your, your project is that you were able to point out uh, those, like, for example, what happened with isolation, which was something that at the EU level we had not seen before, right? But I think that what is uh, interesting is that because of the magnitude of, of this crisis, certain actors at the EU level and also at the national level that probably were previously reluctant or, or did not feel challenged uh, because they had not felt that vulnerability before, uh, were more open. So for example, we have the care strategy at the EU level, which probably would not would not be the same if we had not experienced the, the COVID crisis. But at the same time, I think that we have to read the COVID crisis together with what happened in Ukraine, uh, which is of course another, another crisis. Uh, and we have seen that uh, there are also some actors, uh, political actors that are willing to sacrifice issues that we were already taking for granted. So I think that one of the um, things that we have to take into account is that we need to find allies. It was said also in, in a previous panel at the level of policy making. Uh, we need to read the political moment to see how we can move forward because we need also, uh, you know, the, that that political side to to be able to 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 implement all the things that that are being recommended in the project. Um, I also think that we have to distinguish at least when we are talking about the, the crisis a scenario between those measures that need to stay there regardless of whether there is a crisis or not but that have an impact or a more impact when when we are dealing with a crisis from those that are needed only uh, in the realm of of, of, of of this kind of of crisis like the ones that we have experienced right uh, in the terms of civic response it is clear you analyzed it very good in your in your project uh, civil society organizations are filling the gaps uh, and we have a pending debt there. We need to have stronger channel, um, formal channels of communication between governments at the national, regional, and local level and civil society organizations. If not, I think it's going to be complicated to, to move forward. We already talked about the transformative uh, funding, so I will not talk about that. But we also need, and I think that is linked to what you have been saying, we need strong, resilient public services and a full commitment to gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting. I think that some of the issues that are covered 
have been uh, previously analyzed in other crises. And one of the big problems that we have right now is that we need that, uh, that full commitment, so to speak. We've seen it at the European level. Uh, recently, in 2021, after the COVID crisis, the, court, the European Court of Auditors told us that the European Commission was not yet living up to its commitment to gender mainstreaming and EU budget. So we need to move forward on, on that sense. Um, but the crisis has also allowed us to build new creative, innovative strategies. We've mentioned some of them. That is great. Um, and I think that we have to analyze whether uh, we can replicate them as, as we have known them, if we need to adapt them, considering that we might face completely different crises, or if we can think about, um, you know, new, uh, let's say, alternative proposals that might even be better considering the previous experience we have with, with, with COVID, right? So in that sense, I think that sharing best practices, which is what we are doing today, is absolutely necessary. And we need really formal channels also of sharing best practices also at the EU and at the national levels. Um, obviously, states cannot act alone. Uh, the COVID crisis made that very clear. So from my point of view, we also need to, let's say, uh, strengthen, develop some of the suggestions that you made so that we can make them very concrete at the EU level so that we can try to do advocacy to include them in the next years. And that would be all from my side. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Elena. Is that really a lot? Please Juliana. pass on to Liliana, maybe. And Liliana, as you reflect on the future, you can also tell us what we missed. Yeah, you are, um, you are curious about it, yeah. I see it. Yeah, okay. So um, what I don't agree with is a finding um, somewhere in, in some of the fact sheets, uh, which says something like um, that the process of the implementation of the Istanbul Convention um, in Europe has been um, ineffective and slow. I, I, I wouldn't agree. Um, um, based on my uh, eight years of experience in Grevio, in Grevio um, I can say that uh, the implementation of the convention, um, um, uh, it, actually that the problem uh, with the implementation of course is visible, uh, but it cannot, uh, I do not agree with this general assessment that is uh, across Europe uh, ineffective. Um, because in each and every country that we analyzed so far, and I can tell you that I contributed to each and every report that we produced so far, uh, we noted uh, a very uh, considerable progress. Maybe we are not very happy with, uh, uh, with the level of progress, but we noted progress in each and every country. Uh, the uh, the convention is demanding, and it is it cannot be uh, expected that each and every government will uh, apply all the provisions to its full extent, so that uh, the Istanbul Convention will fulfill its promise. It, because the promise of the convention is that it can improve women's lives and it can also save lives if uh, implemented properly. It's a big uh, promise, uh, but um, I would uh, uh, like to underline that the convention has a big potential to, uh, and that it can be seen as a driver of change in countries uh, that ratified um, the convention. There are many things that we are, as feminist movement, are not happy um, uh, about, but let's further use strategically the convention as uh, the, the, the strategic instrument for improving uh, women's lives. And this area of funding is the key um, because at all levels, we can see that grassroots, uh, grassroots NGOs are neglected, are marginalized in funding uh, schemes. Uh, please also do not forget that in countries of the Western Balkans, the idea that government should fund NGOs is a strange idea. It's not real, she knows, uh, because uh, it is somehow expected that international donors are supposed to fund NGOs. Um, it's not like in the EU where it is uh, uh, taken for granted that uh, service uh, providing NGOs should be funded by the public money. 
So it's not really an accepted idea at a new level. That's the first thing. And second thing, um, um, at the EU level, grassroots NGOs have no chance when they apply for funds. They are too small. They do not have uh, skills to apply to extremely complex uh, EU funding procedures. And there are less and less uh, funding opportunities they can use. Uh, UN agencies are also providing funding in certain parts of Europe, such as Moldova, such as uh, Serbia or Montenegro or, or Albania, but this is also not um, uh, enough. If you are talking about solidarity, EU funding should be expanded in a different uh, manner the procedure should be simplified so that uh, uh, some parts of, uh, uh, of Europe, uh, some countries which are not part of EU uh, should not be neglected. Uh, and certain uh, 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 collaboration between uh, women's NGOs in uh, EU countries and those from neglected parts of Europe uh, should be strengthened in, in my way. Thank you. In That's really way. an important reminder, both of your comments, that we need to be more sophisticated about the context and also build uh, across the board uh, collaborations. Um, and certainly, you know, the example of FemFund, for instance, is a, a good example of how the grassroots organizations can access EU level funding through an intermediary participatory feminist funding structure. So just a couple of minutes, uh, please, be. Aslan. How do you see us moving forward with what we have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic? We have been thinking about it because we have been through a lot of crisis and we have lost friends uh, on the ground. I just need to mention their names, like, you know, Kibar Özdemir, Hatice Can. On, they were on the earthquake region. They are still with us. We lost them. So the thing is, I want to highlight, we, it wasn't in the recommendations, but I know that you are working on it too. Well-being is very important. Those people that we are talking about, the grassroots people that are trying to you know, change what's really happening on the ground, we need to talk about well-being, be it digital, be it face-to-face. -face. We need to talk about how we you know, take care of each other and how we are, you know, sustain our systems. We, we make sustainable systems for, you know, grassroots organizations to continue their work. This is one issue I think is important to raise. Another thing that as um, Liliana has mentioned through funding, but I think it's also about the um, EU elections that is coming 2024, you know, Turkey has another election, local uh, elections coming in 2024. So with that, we have more areas to advocate, lobby, you know, make our voices more heard so that the multi-annual financial framework of the European Union and the Commission will be more inclusive, gender, you know, uh, gender sensitive, and it, how it is actually reached to grassroots organizations will be another thing. Adding to what Biliana has said, I won't repeat that, but also most of the grassroots women organizations are not interested in the EU funding because they don't find it, you know, they don't want to put their daily work into a certain framework so that they would, they will get money from, you know, this is how we structure funding is also should be more inclusive and heard through, you know, um, grassroots needs. I think it will more uh, visualize when I talked about, um, uh, just another final highlight will be about this, you know, from this crisis, earthquakes, another crisis that's going to come up. We learn to create coalitions. We, you know, we learn to work together with different rights-based based organizations. It was difficult, honestly, when we had the Istanbul Convention withdrawal, not many rights-based organizations were first, you know, interested about women's rights in that sense. But then we learned together that we are there for each other's battles. So we need to get bigger we need to get bigger in the rooms when we discuss in our corners so i think with the climate crisis with the you know um, attacks on anti-gender we need to collaborate more that's another example is the united for istanbul convention we brought feminist and lgbti organizations together it is very important for climate crisis we try to bring grassroots women organizations to speak more about the climate action so that it has a, the first impact on them as well, so that they are aware of it. It is also important to hear mention another name, Murat Cekic, yeah. 
who we lost on the way. We don't know how we'll get further information, but he was a human rights activist as well. He was bringing those different, you know, sectors of, you know, um, rights-based uh, actors on the ground. So we lost one, one of ours as well. So this is a continuous continuum of crisis, continuum of should be solidarity, continuum of further, you know, alliances, further friendships, long lasting ones. So I very much thank you and all of you for your contribution to Resistre. So I should highlight that we should never leave anyone behind and continue more stronger. Thank you very much. Exactly. Thank you for those strong words. And indeed, may he rest his peace, in peace. Murat Cekici really embodied what we were talking about here, making connections between different rights uh, movements and struggles. So Maria, maybe we, uh, you would, would you like to say just a couple of words about what's, how to look forward from what we have learned? Well, after the meeting that we had this morning on publications, it's a very difficult question to answer because uh, we are um, having a lot of information in front of us, but the problem of time that was mentioned before is our problem now. And I, was, I would like to take this opportunity also to mention here one important aspect that is linked with the research that has been done, especially within Resistire, but also because thanks to Resistire, I was part of the uh, European Commission expert group working on the impact of COVID on research. And I, I would like to mention that we were doing all these research while COVID-19 were being locked down in our homes, in our universities, with no access to many resources, combining the research with other activities and also with care-related activities because we were also locked down. And this had an impact on us as our researchers and as women researchers and the importance of talking about our own well-being. We did a great job, but at what cost? How many hours did we spend? How uh, interesting those open studios were, but how tough they were being so many hours in front of the computer. So I think that I have a, a, a direct question here now to the European Commission. How do we move forward now with all the resources and all the information that we have, but the, our time is over or officially over? How can we give uh, and sustain the fundings and and the 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 findings and the funding, funding yeah. <laughs> that we need to 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 keep on doing this type of research. So I think that is my main reminding question. Thank you, Maria. Dorana, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I will definitely try to highlight the things that were already mentioned. I think that we came to the stage where we should look closer to the things that women organization and feminist organization did through their principles and approach. At least they made sure that no one is left behind. While on the other sides, we had many systematic solutions that really did left someone behind. So yeah. let's take a closer look to all the things that have been done during the pandemic uh, and that all those amazing women and girls all around the world did. Wow, fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> and let's really be honest with it. Let's make sure that feminist organization and civil society organization are not filling up the systematic gaps, but that they are really a part of systematic solutions because they are already doing that. Great. Thank you, Zorana. Punar? Just pass it on. Yeah. Moving forward, uh, I want to say a few words about the concept of care. I know in another panel, and we were, we're going to talk about it, but I think this pandemic was a great opportunity to see that care is not all about all about the private sphere, caring for other people, caring for our beloveds, but more of a political concept that we should put at the center of life, which is true because it is actually at the center of life. But our current systems and structures are not only uh, falling short of responding to the crisis, but actually sustaining, reproducing the crises and making them all very normal. So moving forward, I think the, this is one of the greatest lessons we can uh, have. A second point, um, during, I can talk 
based on my experience from Turkey that uh, very often we reduce civil society organizations to uh, service providers because the government and other relevant authorities are not doing their job. But I see a greatest risk here because we also need civil society for advocacy and activism and uh, many funds are not uh, for that, right? It's mostly for uh, ser service provision. So uh, we need more funding also for advocacy and activism and more individual giving, individual donations, which will acknowledge the fact that uh, money is not the only resource. Uh, the expertise, the local knowledge, the experience, they are also the resources that we should all mobilize at a local, national and international level. Yeah, and all the networks that these organizations have built both within their worlds and across all these borders. So uh, we are running out of time, but I really wanted to give the last word to uh, our amazing uh, scientific coordinator, Sophia Street, who is also coordinating the sister project UNISAFE that has also produced important results and recommendations for addressing gender-based violence. And Sophia herself personally has done uh, cutting edge work on gender-based violence. So Sophia, what would you like to say about how we look forward from here. Okay, thank you. Um, I had three three main points from listening to the, the panel, but I'm going to choose one of them because <laughs> I've got one minute. And it's, I mean, I was certainly convinced before this panel and I was, I read the panel action. Right, so I'm, I'm even more convinced now that we need to push back the market forces. So the market forces are moving into the gender-based violence movement. They're moving into the shelter movement. And we have private actors running shelters. We have private actors treating gender-based violence as a money-making business. They have no interest in empowering women. They have no interest in challenging patriarchy. They have no interest in advocacy, capacity building, or awareness raising. They want to make money out of violence. So I think that's the main, and this also resonates to what Madeline was saying with, you know, the, the bad C. <laughs> the, we, we need to, you know, so the future for me is uh, push out the market and let civil society take the role that they, and fund them to take the role that they can, well, can take. Okay, thank I'll you skip so the much, second Sophia. Two. Yes. <laughs> so... Thank you everyone for these amazing insights. Really everyone here on this panel embodies what we're talking about, feminist solidarity and creative response to crises. And uh, going back again to Asla Alpar's wonderful uh, illustration, inviting us to move, look forward and move forward in solidarity. Uh, which is exactly what we have learned to do, learning a lot from the organizations on the ground and the amazing creativity and resilience that they have built. And uh, hopefully we will be um, moving with all that we have learned uh, together with all the stakeholders and um, create the changes that we know are crucial. And yes, Feminist Plus Solidarity, Queer Plus Solidarity has saved lives during this crisis and in other crises. Um, hopefully uh, we will not be in need of saving lives, but we will be making this world a better place to live all together. So thank you all for being with us today and for sharing your insights. And thank you all for joining this conversation. Thank you all of you for, for coming. So thank, uh, and a special thanks to, to our external speakers uh, too who have come, our experts and representative of Pilot Project. We'd like to thank you with a, a small gift memory from, from Belgium. Thank you very much. For those of you who would uh, have questions burning on your lips that you would have liked to address to, the, to, to these panelists, we'll, well, we encourage you to stay on for a, for a dinner and to carry on talking uh, later on and to, so to save your questions for later and to ask them on an one-to-one -one basis.